All right, all right. Good morning, good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's. Greetings in the name and grace and peace of Jesus, our resurrected Christ. Thank you so much for being a part of worship this morning, whether you're joining us in person or online. We're grateful that you're here. Uh, if you want to take a moment uh, to share your attendance with us, we would be grateful. There should be notebooks on the end of your row if you're here with us in person. Online, you can see ways to register your attendance, but we'd be grateful if you did that because it's a blessing to know that you're here and to be able to stay in connection and community with you. Uh, additionally, we would love to be in prayer with you. So if there's ways that we can pray for you uh, in the week ahead, there are prayer cards in those notebooks. Um, you can also email a prayer request to Pastor Eric. It's an honor for us as a community uh, to share in that together and to know that uh, we, we don't do this journey alone. So um, thanks, for, thanks for taking a moment to do that. Uh, just really uh, a couple of announcements as we get started. First of all, uh, St. Paul's has a long history with El Porvenir, which is um, a service opportunity in Guatemala. Is that right? Nicaragua. I'm sorry. I knew I was going to get that wrong. Um, and we've not been able to go since before the pandemic, and we are uh, going to have a conversation right after worship downstairs about sending a team there in the near future. So if you have any interest in learning more about what that looks like or, or how you might get involved with that, I would encourage you to head down to the Bridge Classroom immediately after worship. Uh, you're not committing to anything. It's just an opportunity to hear a little bit more about that partnership and a little bit more about what it would look like to be, um, to be a part of that. And so I uh, would encourage you to come be a part of that conversation. Um, and then the last thing that I want to say is that today we're beginning the season of Lent. Now, uh, Lent in the church is the 40-day uh, season, 40-ish day season, uh, that leads up to Easter. And so it, it starts on Ash Wednesday, and it takes us to Easter. And it's the custom of the church to approach these days with self-examination and with repentance and with preparation. And so in the ancient church, this was a season in which uh, people who were getting ready to join the church uh, entered into a, a time of preparation to, to be baptized, in which people who became disconnected from the church entered a season uh, of reflection so that they could be reconnected in community once again. And for us in the modern church, it's often a time of, of self-denial or of giving something up or of fasting, with the intent being that we turn more frequently and more intentionally to God. And so as a church in this Lenten season, uh, we're embarking on a, on a particular way of examining uh, not only uh, ourselves individually, but we as a, as a congregation, the ministry that we do together as we look at the discipleship pathway. Friends, I'm very excited for that journey. We'll hear all about it throughout the service and throughout the upcoming weeks, but uh, today we're focusing on what we say is an important practice of worshiping weekly. And so I'm grateful that, that you're here to worship, that we can join together. Uh, I'm grateful that we can reflect on what that means. I was thinking uh, particularly this week when you have uh, experiences like the parade and the shooting and the disorienting nature of that, how grateful I am uh, to, to have a community of faith to gather with, to help process some of that, to name some of that, to pray through that, to, to remind ourselves that as, as disorienting and as isolating as that can feel, uh, we are not on this journey alone. So I'm grateful that you're here and would invite you to turn your hearts to a time of worship. Hear the song of David while in the wilderness. O oh, true God, you are my God, the one whom I trust. I seek you with every fiber of my being in this dry and weary land with no water in sight. My soul is dry and longs for you. My body aches for you, for your presence. I've seen you in your sanctuary and been awed by your power and glory. Your steadfast love is better than life itself. So my lips will give you all my praise. I will bless you with every breath of my life. I will lift up my hands in praise to your name. I would pray that would be our prayer and our outcry this morning. So I'm going to invite everyone to stand and worship with us. And we're going to give him all of our praise this morning and bless the Lord with everything in our lives. I invite you to sing with us. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. 10,000 reasons to lift up praise to our maker and our Lord. Let's sing, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh, my soul. I worship his holy name. 
sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship your holy name. The sun comes up. The sun comes up. It's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Sing like never before. Oh my soul. I worship your in love. You're rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand, ten thousand reasons for my heart. thousand years. Ten thousand years and then forever more. Sing forever more. Forever more. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Oh my soul. Worship His holy name. Sing like men. Articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry, then from north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Were the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain 
mountaintops, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Let's lift this up together. Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. When every creature finds its inmost melody, and every human heart its native cry, then in one enraptured hymn of praise, we'll sing Christ be magnified. Your praise, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips, ever be on my lips, your praise will ever be on my lips. Ever be on my lips. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified. Altar of my life, Christ be magnified in me. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. During this season of Lent, uh, I'm just thinking a little bit different in this time in uh, bringing a prayer of confession each week. Um, we do this not to beat up on ourselves, but to create space for God to come and do a new thing in our lives. To ask for the help that we need to become more fully all of who God made us to be. So let's go to God in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the way of peace. God, come into the brokenness of our lives and our land with your healing love. Help us be willing to bow before you in true repentance. 
submit to one another in real forgiveness. By the power of your Holy Spirit, melt our hard hearts and consume the pride and prejudice that separate us. Fill us, O Lord. Fill us with your perfect love, which casts out our fear and binds us together in that unity that you share with the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, hear this good news. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are a forgiven people. Thanks be to God. We continue in prayer. God, yes, you are our peace. And we need peace, God, this morning in so many ways. God, we lift up the places of brokenness and conflict and struggle that are all around us in our own hearts, the struggle we have with ourselves, struggle to name and live out all of who you've made us to be in Christ, to be fully ourselves for your glory. God, the struggle that we have uh, in our homes, in our, in our families, in our schools, in our workplaces, in our neighborhoods. God, you know these struggles. God, the struggles that we have when it's hard to deal with grief, where you feel far away, God, we, where we are unsure about um, the health and welfare of loved ones, we bring those to you now. God, uh, as we shared at Ash Wednesday, uh, it's um, difficult for our city to see um, celebration and, and pride in, in our city um, immediately um, get lost and, and washed away as an act of violence. Um, the parade rally. God, help us to rally once again, rally around each other, rally around the healing that you want for our community, that looks more like your reign. God, we pray for those who are still recovering and will be recovering, including witnesses that have encountered trauma. God, we pray for your healing. God, we pray for our gun culture, and we want to repent once again for the ways we turn to violence so easily. Help us, oh God. God, we pray for your peace in our land, across our nation, and all the ways that we're divided from one another. God, and across the world in armed conflicts. We need your peace. God, help us to do our part, but too, it feels overwhelming. Help us take our steps and then, God, look to you. For I believe only you can bring the peace, the not just absence of conflict, but wholeness, the healing, the shalom that our whole world needs. We ask you to do it in us and through us and around our world. And we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Each week we get to share about something great happening in the life of our church and uh, today, you know, we're, we're looking at the discipleship pathway. I hope you've connected with a small group um, this week as we're discussing the discipleship pathway together. Uh, this week, as Pastor Kyle said, we're looking at, um, and I hope you got your passport out front um, that can start getting stamped. Uh, uh, Pastor Kyle said we're, we're talking about Worship Weekly um, this week. And uh, I think you know, but I want to remind us that there are so many pieces that come together to make worship happen that are not um, uh, not up here in, in the chancel. Uh, lots of faces that we don't always get to recognize. Uh, so one, I just want to say thanks be to God um, for uh, you know folks like like Opal and Charlie back there in the in the sound and video booth. 
Um, can we just give God a hand clap for, for them? Um, for, uh, you know, um, um, Gary and Christy, who helped with our kids. For Larry, who's back there greeting always. Um, there are so many ways that, that worship comes together as, as a, uh, you know, liturgy means work of the people. And this is a work of all the people together. Uh, and so I hope as you came in that you got one of these um, that talks about different roles that um, you might want to help with music, with usher, greeter, communion server, tech, visual arts, help with kids, um, celebration of life that it says on here. If you're not familiar with that team, that's who helps us um, with hospitality and, and, um, and food and, and greeting folks in a time of grief with, with funerals. And so um, if any of those interest you, or if all, you can check all of them if you like, um, you can uh, uh, put that in the basket up here, put that in the communion plate. Uh, uh, Alice Wright, who helps coordinate a lot on Sunday morning. Thank you, Alice. Um, there's Alice, and she'll be at the table by the Discipleship Pathways desk um, uh, after our worship service. So there's lots of ways you could check one of these out. Uh, you're not making any commitment right now, but we'll be in touch, and we'd love your help in all that happens um, on Sunday mornings. And so uh, with that, uh, it has, we've come to our, the time of our offering. What a privilege it is to get to bring our gifts, um, all that God's given us of our, our presence and our talents and our finances, uh, that we get to offer those in this time. Uh, kids, if you guys would like to go, there's a special time for you with Kids Connection up to sixth grade. Um, you guys can head out uh, with Mr. Gary back there. Uh, thank you. And um, our ushers will, uh, will have us pass our, our baskets for the offering at this time. I invite you to stand and sing our doxology together. Oh, bless the gifts our hands have brought, and bless the work our hearts have planned. Ours is the faith, the will, the thought. The rest, oh God, is in your hand. Would you join me in prayer? Good and holy God, we give you thanks for the many blessings that you've given to us, for the countless ways that you have blessed each one of us. God, in the midst of joy and triumph, in the midst of challenge and uncertainty, help us to take account of the ways that you continue to work in our midst. Thank you for what's been offered here today. Uh, those physical gifts and those gifts that have been given online, take what is offered, multiply it, use it for the building of your kingdom here on earth that all might know your grace and your peace in our time and our place. This we ask and pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Friends, uh, before you are seated, if you would take just a couple of minutes to greet those who are worshiping with you, I think it's important for us to uh, acknowledge one another. If you don't know somebody's name, you can tell them yours and ask them theirs.
It's a little toasty in here. The jacket had to come off. I'm sorry. I don't know how I'm going to make it through next service in a row, but friends, um, I'm excited for this season of Lent. As we've said already a couple of times, we're looking at our discipleship pathway. I just want to lift up a, um, a couple of the opportunities. Um, I appreciate a, a beautiful space, um, and so it was uh, Susie Dutton and our visual arts team that made this beautiful cloth, which I love, which of course coordinates with uh, who all of our colors and branding as a congregation. Uh, Jesse uh, did the lights, which is awesome. Anyway, there's I say I lift that up to say there are a lot of ways that you can participate, that you can be a part of worship, uh, many of which don't even require Sunday mornings, that you can help uh, families in grief with the Celebration of Life team if you're available midweek, that you can help uh, some of those behind-the-scenes things. And so um, we didn't leave a blank on that card, which was an oversight on my part. But if you would like to write in, um, if you, like, tired of Kyle preaching, I'll preach. Um, <laughs> You can do that as well, but just would encourage you to think about that. Anyway, I'm excited about this, uh, this season of Lent, and um, I, I trust that you have noticed on the sign and outside that love, seek, serve are, are big themes for this congregation, that that's been a part of our mission to love God and all others unconditionally, to seek answers to our questions, and to serve God by serving others. That's been a part of, of this church for a long time, and then uh, it's been just in the, a little bit more recently, maybe uh, um, right before the pandemic, that we, we sort of assigned uh, nine practices, three practices under each one of those, uh, about what, it, uh, what we think it means to be a disciple at St. Paul's. Or another way to say is, is how is it that we at St. Paul's make disciples? And it's, it's different here than it is at other churches. I think every congregation has a unique way of doing that. All of us are trying to point towards the same thing to model our lives after Jesus, and yet we all do it in different sorts of ways. And so this discipleship pathway is a living document that helps inform how it is that we do our life together and how it is that you might grow uh, in your faith as a, as a person of this congregation. And so we're going to be uh, talking about the discipleship pathway in several mediums. So we'll have Sunday mornings. Uh, we'll be talking about it. Uh, we have this book that was put together that I am just more excited that I can tell you about. Nine clergy who are related to St. Paul's um, contributed to this, plus the chairs of our Love, Seek, Serve team. Uh, Janice, who works for us in communications, put it all together. It's beautiful. I'm grateful for the reflections. And in it, there are questions for you to consider uh, what it means for you to do each one of these practices, but what it means for us as a community to live more fully into the practices that we talk about and, and that we say are important. So we've got that going on. We've got small groups. If you're part of an ongoing small group, I hope that you guys are talking about that in one form or fashion. Um, if you aren't, we have three uh, short-term small groups just through Lent to talk about this. Pastor Eric has one this afternoon at four o'clock. There's child care available for that. Uh, there's um, one that I lead at six o'clock on Tuesday evenings. And then there's one on Thursdays over the lunch hour that you can do in person or via Zoom. We actually have people joining from across the country for that one, which is super cool. So there's ways to plug in, and we hope that's part of the conversation. We've got videos that we'll uh, be sharing in those small groups of some of the folks who, who helped write this uh, that, that dives a little bit deeper and in interview uh, into some different ideas and, and, and pulling out some, some different concepts. And, and those have turned out fantastic. And then, of course, uh, we also have this passport. And so our, our invitation and challenge for you is to get, um, to get your stamps, as one does on a passport throughout this season of Lent, uh, that you might uh, make uh, worshiping weekly a priority, that you might make reading the Bible daily a priority, uh, that you would take some time to go and serve or to seek justice or to practice, practice justice. And as you do that, um, there are even nifty coordinated stamps by both color and design out in the welcome area because we have thought of everything. Um, so you can stamp your, your passport as you go, and of course there is a prize if you get it all stamped. And so just saying, I don't know what else to do. Um, but there's a lot of ways that we're engaging this, and I'm grateful for this journey. And today we're beginning by looking at worshiping weekly. And so I want to start by just saying what it is that I think we mean when we talk about worship. And I'm going to suggest that worship can mean and can look like many different kinds of things. Uh, Paul Babcock is a retired United Methodist pastor. He's the one who wrote the chapter on this in our book. Um, and he sort of alludes to this both in the writing and in the video uh, for small groups to talk about worship can look like something that is personal and individual, 
But today, I'm going to assume that since it's right at the top of our list for discipleship pathway, um, and it qualifies a time frame to do so weekly, I'm going to focus on what regular public worship together looks like. And I think that's primarily what, what we mean when we say worship weekly. With all that happens in our life and with all the talk in our culture about decreasing worship uh, attendance in churches uh, across the board, across the United States, uh, worship still is and always has been the most popular thing that Christian communities do together. I mean, I want us to think about that. This is the one thing where, where people from all different corners and backgrounds of the church come together on a regular basis. It's always been part and parcel to what it means uh, to be a follower of Jesus. We as a church community and as churches across the country direct the most amount of our resources to our, our regular public gathered worship together. We have the highest participation in it. And so from the beginning of the church, when, when worship happened in homes around tables with meals and prayer and reflection, even to today, we, we know that worship sort of plays a prominent role in the life of a community together and that it's, it's incredibly important. I'm, I'm thankful that we get to gather together. Uh, I also know that we have people who join us from a distance and join us online, and it's such a gift that we have people like Jesse and Charlie and their volunteers who help make that uh, professional and possible, um, and, and that we get, get to have people join us uh, from across, uh, across the country in different places, uh, or, or when we're sick or when we're at home or can't get out. I'm grateful for that, and it's a chance for us to connect in community from afar. So, so it's always been the primary practice of the church community. Um, it's the beginning of our discipleship pathway and I want to talk about what the big deal is and, and why it's so central to our faith as a people of faith. And so I want to go back to the beginning for that. No, before I do that, I want to read the psalm. I'm sorry, Jesse. Psalm 42. I got excited. We'll go to the beginning after that. <laughs> psalm 42, beginning in verse 1. As a deer longs for flowing streams, so my soul longs for you, O God. My soul thirsts for you, the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me continually, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I went with the throng that led to the procession of the house of God with glad shouts and songs of thanksgiving, a multitude keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise God, my help and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you in the land of Jordan and Hermon, from Mount Miser, deep calls to deep. At the thunder of your, cat, of your cataracts, all the waves and the billows have gone over me. By day, the Lord commands his steadfast love, and by night, his song is within me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I walk about mournfully because of the enemies that oppress me? As with a deadly wound in my body, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me continually, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, and I shall again praise him, my God and my help. I got a blessing to our reading and understanding of these words. So I want to go back to the beginning of the scripture narrative, all the way back to Genesis. You remember there is a poem that opens the scriptures that talks about how it is that, that God created all things. And, and this sort of creative interpretation and understanding, there is a pattern that follows that, that God creates and calls it good, and that is a day. And, and this continues on. And when we get to the end of the first poem of creation that comes at the beginning of the scriptures, it says this, on the sixth day, God finished the work that God had done and rested on the seventh day from all the work that had been done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. And so right there at the very beginning of the scriptures, you get this, this sort of rhythm that's followed, and it's picked up all throughout the text. If you go forward, we see that, that God tells the Israelite people while they're uh, wandering the wilderness to make this priority a priority. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. This is Exodus 20. But on the seventh day, it shall be a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not do any work for six days. For in six days, the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and consecrated it. The prophets keep calling the people to, to remember this holy sort of rhythm. I am the Lord your God, Ezekiel says in chapter 20. Be careful to observe my ordinances and hallow my Sabbaths so that they may be assigned between me and you, so that you may know that I am the Lord your God. 
So we, we see this in the prophets. And then if we continue on in the news, New Testament, we find that Jesus and his family practice worship on a regular basis. We find that, that the apostle Paul commanded it. We find that the writer of Hebrews calls us to not neglect gathering with one another. And the writer of Revelation envisioned an eternity that was focused solely on worship of God all around the clock. But I want us to think back to those first few texts. Notice the way that the story of the divine is told. There is this pattern, this work, 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 rest, serve, 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 pause, create, 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 recenter. There is this rhythm and this pattern and this beat that sort of goes all through the scriptures. And so I wonder if you might just clap with me like this. Some of you just got terrible looks on your face because you're rhythmically challenged. And the idea of having to clap together feels really challenging. Some of you are like, I can clap or listen, Kyle, but I can't do both. When the band asks you to sing and clap, you're like, pick. Which is it? So I think there is this rhythm that happens. I just want you to keep on clapping. That happens all throughout the scriptures, that, that we have this sort of pattern that is followed as we go through the scriptures. But what can happen sometimes is that as that goes on and on and on, we begin to lose the beat a little bit. And so I see that I've lost some of you. You can stop. <laughs> some of you have quit and some of you are try trying and God bless you for trying. But what happens, and maybe you've experienced this before in a concert, is that, that when we begin to clap, when, when sort of the, the, the leadership of that falls around, the, the, the congregation ends up going all over the place. So here's what that has to do with worship. One of the things that we know is that we are hardwired for this notion of worship. Uh, Eric, in the video for small groups, talked about Bob Dylan saying, all of us worship something. It's in our DNA. There's a piece within us that wonders what our purpose in life is, that, that, that knows that there must be something beyond what we can touch and feel and understand uh, that, 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 that we are, are meant to connect with. The other side of that thing says that, that we are going to worship and follow and attune our lives towards something. We call that worship or adoration to, to set our path or our direction. So to worship means to show reverence or adoration, to honor, to put in a place of priority, to hold an extravagant regard or respect or honor, to devote or orient oneself. That is to say, each of us will center our lives on something and then we will move in that direction. We will give adoration to all of that. And, and so we can do that with lots of different things. Sometimes we do that with, with people. Uh, sometimes we do that with sports figures or political figures. What happens is we begin to, to orient ourselves to them. Paul Babcock talks in, in, in the video about uh, how uh, he, he loves and appreciates sports players and what teams are able to do to come together. But, but some people, that's, that's what they worship. We can, we can worship possessions and wealth. We can worship our own autonomy and our security and our own strength. Uh, some people worship themselves. We can worship power in many different forms. You can define that in many ways in your life. And so what happens is, is when we do that, we orient ourselves to something besides God, and we'll be inclined to worship that something. And when we do that, we lose that, that rhythm and that framework and that structure. We're left marching to the beat of our own drum, and oftentimes it doesn't stay together. So, so if that happens to us in the course of 30 seconds clapping, what happens to us when we go out beyond this place? When we're left on our own, what happens, I think, is that, that we begin to fall into these different rhythms and we lose track of the beat. I was thinking back um, uh, to January last, uh, last month, last year. It feels like a year ago. And I don't know about you, but between the weather uh, and some illness that we had in my family and a little bit of travel, I think most of the month of January, I didn't know what day it was. Did you have that experience? And it, it felt like I just kept getting confused. And yet somehow, the one thing that stayed consistent through all of that, that's a blessing for me, is that Sunday would roll back around. Now, sometimes that's scary for pastors because Sunday is always coming this preaching moment is always coming, and yet there is this gift that in the midst of the chaos and the change and the transformation and all that changes around us, there is this constant rhythm that we can hold to. So our psalm today begins by saying, my soul is longing, thirsting, and waiting for the living God. 
Basically, the writer is saying, I need God. And that's the very beginning of it. When we say that we worship something, that, that we need to put our devotion and adoration towards something. And if we are to be a people of faith who follow Jesus, then that adoration gets directed towards God. And so gathering in community to worship gives us a framework. It, it gets us back on rhythm, helps us find the beat. It is the foundation for the rest of our discipleship. That's why it's so important, I think, for the church historically and for us in, in our discipleship pathway. And so since we were talking about rhythm and beat, I wanted to ask Jenny Adams to come forward, who is our drummer extraordinaire. Um, and Jenny, I wonder, uh, instead of me clapping, if you might just give us some simple beat. Um, what would happen if we all started clapping while Jenny was playing is that we would get that reconnection and that recentering, and we would be able to stay more or less together. You might slip a little bit, but then you would get back in. And so that's what sort of happens regularly in the Christian life, is that we, we do that. We, we get that sort of regular connection that helps make all of the dance that's going on around us make a little bit more sense. So what if we just added a little bit to that? This feels a little bit more like what life sounds like in my life anyway. So we have that, but what happens if we then lose that, that two and that four? Thank you. There is this regular pattern that we have that keeps us on beat and going, and we have all this other noise that we try to organize to make fit, but it's been my experience that when we lose that central point, uh, for, for us in music, that two and four, things begin to feel a little bit funky. It, it sounds, uh, in my head, it sounds a little bit like salsa dancing, which sounds exhausting. If you dance salsa, that's impressive, uh, but we can't live like that all the time. What happens is things get more sporadic, and here's what all that means in the life of discipleship. Worship is what helps us stay moored because life can be really challenging and, and it can be overwhelming both in, in good ways and in bad ways. And part of the power and the significance of that main beat that keeps us together is it, it helps us remember the long game. And this is so important for us in worship. When we're on our mountaintop and, and we want to shout out our great joy and everything wonderful happening in the world, it's good to remind ourselves that, that God has blessed us abundantly. It's good to be thoughtful about where we'll focus our attention and our resources when it feels like everything is falling into place. It will keep us humble in those moments when we begin to toot our own horn and say, look at all this work that I have done. But worship will also speak to us in the valley. It will give assurance when we're in a season of grief. When we cry out from a deep and dark place, it will remind us that, that God has been our help in seasons past, all that God has brought us through. It will remind us of the healing that we've experienced. It will remind us as individuals and as a community that, that we're not the first people to go through these struggles. That's part of what I love about liturgy is, is that liturgy and reading the scriptures reminds us that, that while the particularities of our story may be new and may be different, there's nothing new under the sun, and the Christian community has been struggling with these things for so long. It may not be a specific celebration interrupted by gunshot wounds, as we talked about experience this week. But you can find plenty of places in the scriptures and in the liturgies where, where great celebrations were interrupted by sudden violence, where, where people went from sort of the highest mountaintop to the deepest valley in a split second. Worship gives us perspective. It gives us the, the things that we need to keep our rhythm in the midst of life that moves like this. The psalmist says um, that they're downcast and troubled, and then says this, I remember as I pour out my soul about how I gathered in worship. We went in procession to the house of the Lord with glad shouts and songs and thanksgiving, a great multitude singing. In other words, there in the midst of, of the psalmist valley and struggle and difficulty, there is a reminder of that time when we gathered and worshiped. There is a reminder of the work that God has been doing through the people of Israel. There is a reminder of the long game, and it helps keep us from getting too high or too low and reminds us that God is moving in all of the walking in between and that God continues to call us. It keeps us from being tossed in the wind or left in a, in a syncopated funk that is all our own. So we keep the beat, and then when we do that, we can build on the rest of our work that we're called to do as a discipleship people. So 
Jenny, can we just get the whole, all those things you have back there put together? So we can start with something simple, and when we do that, we can spice it up with a little fill, which is nice. I don't know if you've ever been a musician who plays with a drummer who only does fills. What does that sound like to you? Mitch knows somebody. So I want to just have you imagine playing an instrument that you're very good at and trying to keep the beat in the midst of that. Thank you, Jenny, very much. Can you give her a hand? What happens when we get that beat in the right place is that we can add in the flourish, we can put in the fill, we can do those pieces. I believe that when we get our, our worship right, it allows us to build discipleship as it is intended to be. But what I see often happens is that, that people, when we, when we aren't sure how to approach and engage and worship, we start doing all of the other things and we turn it around, we get the flourish, we get to do the, the service and the generosity, we get to do the, the, the prayer and the Bible reading, we get to do the, the connection that happens. And all of those things are good and great. But if we don't keep that central beat, if we don't keep that main rhythm that comes in worship, what happens is, again, we end up going in our own direction. It ends up being exhausting and overwhelming. Worship is the place where we reconnect to the source of life so that we can be energized for the work that we're called to, so that we can live out our discipleship day after day, week after week. All of those other pieces that we do are important, and I think they have to have their foundation in what it is that we do as a worshiping community together. When we gather, part of the gift of it is that we remind ourselves that we are only one of a body. Because this is the place where everybody seems to gather in, in highest numbers, even as worship uh, attendance declines in the church across the United States, it reminds us that, that we're all connected, that we need each other, that our prayer warriors need our justice warriors, need our musicians, need the people to work behind the scenes, that all of us are able to do what we're called to do only when we do it together. We're reminded that, that there is more going on than we can ever participate in, and that's okay. But we support one another, and, and as we engage in all of these various uh, aspects of this discipleship pathway, or whatever discipleship looks like for you, all of it finds its foundation when we can reconnect in that rhythm and that beat, when we can keep it uh, uh, all informed in the right direction. Part of what Paul Babcock says in the video interview that we did is he said, uh, many people can serve and can make a, a transformation in their community. Many people can work for justice, and it's good that people are, and it's good that we're partnering with them. But we, as a people of faith in our tradition, believe that we do those things for a particular reason, in response to the blessings that God has given to us, in response to the transformation that God has given in our lives. That's what centers, that's what moors, that what, that's what anchors our work. Worship is the time where we gather in community to be reminded of that work. I want to go back to the psalm one final time. Therefore, I remember you, the land of Jordan and Hermon, from Mount Miser, deep calls to deep. So right here comes this, this remembering of what it was to gather. Here comes this remembering of what it is that sustains us, which leads to the final words of the psalm. Why are you downcast, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall praise God again, my help, and my God. So friends, what does it mean for us to worship? What does it mean for us to do so with regularity as we come together? It means to find that rhythm, to keep the beat, uh, to stay in that proper uh, sort of pattern of life. It keeps us moored. It helps us uh, to regain our footing it gives purpose to everything else that it is that we do, and it shapes who we are as individuals and as a community. I love that worship, when we understand it properly, is both a place that we come to gather uh, to bring all of last week's stuff before God, to lift it up, to pray, and to be in community, but it's also a springboard. It energizes us, it gives us shape and form, and it sends us out into the world to go and serve and make a difference. May it be so for each one of us. Amen.
to get to gather together in this time. And I, I love this image of keeping the beat. And I, I love that in this service, we, we have communion each time that we gather because it, it's a place where we tell the whole story of God. And we remind each other of the story that matters and the story that we're trying to live by uh, with one another's help. As Pastor Kyle said, uh, we remind each other of how we're part of something bigger, that we're interconnected as one people. And so uh, it is indeed a gift that we get to gather in this time, in this way, around this meal. And I pray that you know of, of God's connecting grace uh, in, this, in this time. Let's go to God in prayer. God, you have created us for worship. And so it is good. It is right. It is a joyful thing to get together and give thanks to you. For you are almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. God, we remember how you brought all things into being and called them good. Especially you called very good the, the image of God given in us, humanity. You called it very good for us to be not alone, but together. From the dust of the earth, you formed us in your image. You breathed into us the very breath of life. You formed us. God, when we turned away, and we keep doing it, our love fails at times, but God, your love remains steadfast, and so in your faithful love, you sent your son. You sent Jesus to come and rescue and redeem us, to come into our wildernesses as we saw the Spirit lead him uh, directly out of his baptism and his identity as your son led him into the wilderness where he fasted 40 days and 40 nights to prepare for his ministry. And God, he was faithful to the end. He suffered and died on a cross to conquer sin and death. But that wasn't the end of the story. You raised him to life. You kept the beat going. You presented Jesus alive to the apostles during 40 days again, and then you exalted him to your right hand, where he sits living, interceding for us even now. By the baptism of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection, God, you gave birth to your church. You made us one. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death. You told us of a new covenant with, by water and the Spirit. And so in this season of Lent, when we're preparing for the yearly feast of Easter, God, you lead us to repentance for sin and the cleansing of our hearts, and for new growth, that during these 40 days of Lent, we would be gifted in grace to reaffirm once again the covenant you made with us through Christ. It was in a covenant meal that Jesus gave himself to the end for us and he took bread and gave thanks and broke the bread and shared it with his friends and said, take, eat, this is my body and it's given for you. Do this and remember me. Remember the story. In the same way, Jesus, after supper, took the cup, raised it in blessing and shared it with his friends, said, drink of this, all of you. This cup is my blood. It's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this and every time you drink it, Remember me. Remember the big story, God's big love story. And so, God, we do. We come remembering your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, and we come to offer ourselves once again in praise and thanksgiving to be a holy and living sacrifice, just like Jesus gave himself for us. God, pour out your Holy Spirit. We need you. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body of Christ that we would be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. God, it's with your Holy Spirit that we, that we pray. God, the Holy Spirit that makes us one, that makes us one with you, makes us one with one another, makes us one as we go out in ministry with all our gifts to all the world, makes us one until we have that final oneness and Christ comes in final victory and we get to feast together forever in the heavenly banquet. We pray all this made possible, our, our prayers, we come to you through Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church. God, we come because all honor and glory belongs to you, today and tomorrow and forever. 
And so we pray as God's kids, as Jesus taught us to pray, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. As our servers come forward, uh, I will remind us that all are welcome at this table. Uh, We all get to uh, remember and encounter and jump back into the beat, uh, into God's big love story. Uh, I pray that you experience that as you come to this table. You are welcome. All means all. Because God has something for all of us and is connecting all of us. Uh, in and through this meal. Uh, You'll be handed the bread. You can dip it in the cup. There'll be a gluten-free option in the back. Um, You can also light a candle during this time. Um, Thinking about what part of this beat you get to bring. lost ever be found could a garden come out from the ground at all you make beautiful things you make beautiful things out of the dust springing up from this old ground out of chaos life is being found in you you make beautiful things you make beautiful things out of the dark things you make beautiful things out of the dust you make beautiful things you make beautiful things out of us you Oh.
indeed you do make beautiful things. And we give you thanks. God, thank you for this meal. Thank you for reminding us of your great beat. Help us to go keeping the beat and extending this table. Keep feeding us, God. Keep connecting us as one body with you and one another. Yeah, help us to, to be in harmony with you and, and keep that beat, keep that rhythm. Keep telling your story and extending this table that we would be part of how you are feeding the whole world. We thank you, God, for meeting us in our hunger, for making us part of how you extend the table in your love. Go with us. In Jesus' name, amen. My favorite part of worship might be the chance to respond to who God is. So I'm going to invite us to stand in response. And we're going to join that beat with the angels and the saints, right? And we're going to lift up in our response when we see and experience who God is continuously in our lives, this praise and declaration and worship to our God. So let's sing together. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Father, we love you. Father, we love you. We worship and adore you. Glorify thy name in all the earth. Glorify thy name.
and so it is that when we are gathered and when we are apart, that is the work to which we're called, to glorify the name of God, to share the grace of God, to invite others into the peace of God. Go from this place in the rhythm and the strength of this time gathered to share the good news of love and grace with all that you meet. Go in peace. Amen.